Saigon and escaped to America. Life and death issues for us, he says, were merely bargaining chips in the American pursuit of global policy. I played a minor role in the Kennedy administration and a much larger one for half the Johnson years. I saw the Peace Corps go forth one day and the Green Berets the next. Once I wrote a speech for LBJ which implied a striking coincidence between the President's wish and God's will. A wise older man from my past called to gently upbraid me. He reminded me that it's very important how we talk about God because there can be disastrous consequences to what we say. Just so, we've learned that presidents must be very careful talking about what they want this nation to do because the United States can unhinge whole countries simply by shifting our weight. We suffered then the passion of the time that America's defense and security were at stake in Vietnam. But our obsession was the real threat. Vietnam pushed the Cold War morality to its extreme conclusion, exorbitant means to accomplish limited ends. Anything goes. The wounds still run deep. There are 58,000 names on this wall. 58,000 men died in Vietnam. Their deaths and all the deaths in Southeast Asia, the names not on this wall, raise painful questions about our secret government and our role in the world. Were we certain what we ask people to die for? The men who wrote our Constitution tried to make it hard to go to war. Human life was at stake, they knew, and the character of our Republic. War should be soberly decided publicly debated and mutually determined by the people's representatives. It is the people, after all, who must fight, pay, and die once the choice is made. The Constitution was to protect them from dying for the wrong reasons. It was to protect them from killing for the wrong reasons. I don't know. The public still don't want to understand what the hell really happened. Maybe one day they will. It's for Central America. I see the same damn thing happening there in Central America that happened in Vietnam. Well, I think the country has learned uh, very graphically that we better be really assured that if we're going to send our young men and women off to die like this, that it better really be in the interest of every citizen of this United States to sacrifice somebody like that so that we don't have more blood on this wall or other walls. And I think that we ask a lot of questions now that we didn't used to ask. We want to know why. And we'll, we'll hear uh, Ollie North's uh, analysis of what's happening with the Contras, and a lot of us say we want some more verification of that. We want to know just what are we involving ourselves in when we go to do that. Looking back, it's stunning how easily the Cold War enticed us into surrendering popular control of government to the national security state. We've never come closer to bestowing absolute authority on the president. Setting up White House groups that secretly decide to fight dirty little wars is a direct assumption of the war powers expressly forbidden by the Constitution. Not since December 1941 has Congress declared war. Since then, we've had a police action in Korea, advisors in Vietnam, covert operations in Central America, peacekeeping in Lebanon, and low-intensity conflicts going on right now from Angola to Cambodia. We've turned the war powers of the United States over to where we're never really sure who, or what they're doing, or what it costs, or who is paying for it. The one thing we are sure of is that this largely secret global war, carried on with less and less accountability to democratic institutions, has become a way of life. And now we're faced with a question brand new in our history. Can we have the permanent warfare state and democracy too? A shellfish toxin. In 1975, as the war in Vietnam came to an end, Congress no took its first public look at the secret government. Senator Frank Church chaired the Select Committee to Study Government Operations. The hearings opened the books on a string of lethal activities, from the use of electric pistols and poison pellets to mafia connections and drug experiments. And they gave us a detailed account of assassination plots against foreign leaders and the overthrowing of sovereign governments. We learned, for example, how the Nixon administration had waged a covert war against the government of Chile's president, Salvador Allende, who was ultimately overthrown by a military coup and assassinated. Like Caesar peering into the colonies from distant Rome, 
Nixon said the choice of government by the Chileans was unacceptable to the President of the United States. The attitude in the White House seemed to be, if in the wake of Vietnam I can no longer send in, send in the Marines, then I will send in the CIA. But the secret government had also waged war on the American people. The hearings examined a long train of covert actions at home from the bugging of Martin Luther King by the FBI under Kennedy and Johnson to gross violations of the law and of civil liberties in the 1970s. They went under code names such as Chaos, Cable Splicer, Garden Plot, and Leprechaun. According to the hearings, the secret government had been given a license to reach all the way to every mailbox, every college campus, every telephone, and every home. We start out breaking foreign laws, since most countries have laws against secretly overthrowing their governments, and then you end up breaking the law at home and coming to feel a contempt for the law, for your colleagues and associates, for the Congress and the public, and for the Constitution. Morton Halpern worked for Henry Kissinger on the National Security Council in 1969. Critical of policies in Cambodia and Vietnam, he resigned. He later discovered his telephone had been bugged for 21 months. He is now the director of the Washington office of the American Civil Liberties Union. What you have is a growing gap between the perceptions inside the executive branch about what the threats are to our national security and the beliefs in the Congress and the public about the threats to national security. And that leads to secrecy. That is what drives the policy underground. That's what leads the president to rely more on covert operations, and what leads the president and his officials to lie to the public and lie to the Congress about the operation, precisely because they cannot get their way in public debate. They are driven to seek to circumvent the democratic process. And the president ought not to be in a position, in my humble opinion, of having to go out and explain to the American people on a biweekly basis or any other kind that I, the president, am carrying out the following secret operations. It just can't be done. It is said that the constitutional system of checks and balances has so prohibited the president, so hamstrung him, that he cannot effectively lead foreign policy, that he has to be resorting to clandestine, covert, secret What's methods. Better? He needs to do that only when he wants to subvert Congress. If Congress says don't do that, and the president says, but I want to, I want to, I really want to. The conclusion from that isn't that the president is right. It is that the president is considering being an outlaw. It's been said that the secret realm of government is the deformed offspring of the modern presidency. Presidents take an oath to uphold the Constitution, but then they find the cumbersome sharing of power with Congress an obstacle and start looking for shortcuts to silence their critics and achieve their objectives. And it goes back to the beginning. I mean, there is a famous letter which uh, Madison wrote late in his life in which he said, perhaps it is a universal truth that the loss of liberty at home will be charged to dangers real or imagined from abroad. And that is the lesson of history. Was the incentive well, so great or the But we don't seem to learn the lessons of history. Just 14 years ago, another Senate committee listened to another string of witnesses. The names still trip off the tongue. Haldeman, Ehrlichman, Mitchell, and Dean. I began by telling the president that there was a cancer growing on the presidency, and if the cancer was not removed, the president himself would be killed by it. The White House crimes known as Watergate. Cover would be taken off of the telephone, and two of the wires connected with this. Crimes against democracy. To harass opponents, the Nixon White House had set up a secret team called the Plumbers. They bugged phones, opened mail, and burglarized the president's critics. Model Senator Inouye read the Watergate committee a secret White House memo containing the Nixon enemies list and how the plumbers intended to punish them. Stated a bit more bluntly how we can use the available federal machinery to screw our political enemies. In both the Watergate and Iran-Contra hearings, there was contempt for Congress. I believe Congress set up the FBI to determine what was going on in this country, didn't it? Among other things, Mr. Yeah. Chairman. It set up the CIA to determine what was going on in respect to foreign intelligence, didn't it? Yes, sir. And a number of but others. But it didn't set up the plumbers, did it? 
course, the Congress doesn't do everything, Mr. No, Chairman. No, Congress is the only one that's got legislative power, and I don't know anything, any law that gave the president the power to set himself up what some people have called a secret police, name of the plumbers. What was the reason to withhold information from Congress when they uh, inquired about it? I simply didn't want any outside interference. Now, the outside interference...